In this portion of the video on population ecology, we're going to look at what ecology is and how populations grow and change. So ecology is a study of how components of an ecosystem interact. And you may ask, you know, why do I care? Well, a lot of what we do as humans depends on either agriculture or our hunting or fishing. And so if you think about the, say, the lobster industry, we see on the left fishermen off the coast of Chile who are hunting for lobsters and the lobster pots that they use to trap these lobsters. Well, how many lobsters should they be able to catch each season such that they can make money that they need to, the people of Chile and the rest of the world have lobsters to eat, and yet we have enough lobsters remaining that they can breed continuously over the next coming years so that they will survive and they will continue to be a resource for us. Well, questions like that are answered through the study of ecology. Looking at it closer to home, at least for those of you who live in the Virginia area, if we look at the Chesapeake Bay oyster population, before the 1850s, there were tens of millions of oysters. And yet, through a combination of pollution and overfishing, less than 2% of the original number of pre-1850s oysters still are able to live and be sustained in the Chesapeake Bay. And so we have a goal now of trying to get that back up to 10 to 15 percent of that initial pre-human population. Again, a study that ecologists will look at and will work to try to improve. So as we look at some of the terminology that we're going to be using in ecology and which will continue throughout the rest of the biology class this semester, is looking at the combination. Now, I have small to large top to bottom on the left in the definitions, but in the image on the right, these same terms are shown from bottom to top with the smallest being on the bottom and the largest being on the top. So an individual or an organism is the single individual, whether it's an animal, a plant, a bacterium, doesn't matter. A single individual is the individual or organism. Larger than that is a population, which is a group of those individuals that interbreed. So all of the fish or all of the sparrows or all of the wild cats in one area are a population. The community are all of the species that interact with each other in that specific area. So if we have cats and mice and birds and grass and snakes and corn and anything else that is living in that one region, say within Henry County, Virginia, that would be a community. The ecosystem is one larger than that, which includes the non-living components in the area as well. So the water, the soil, the air, um, aspects of temperature and climate as well. And then beyond the ecosystem would be a biome, an area that is defined by a certain climate and certain types of vegetation. And larger than that is the biosphere, which is everything living on the planet. So looking at this, uh, answer the question, and when you're ready, advance to the next slide, and it will be answered for you. So as you can see, the animals as well as the plants would constitute the community. The others are not correct, because if it's just the humans, that would be the population. If it's all of the animals, then we're looking at the ecosystem, and if we look at number four, with the plants and the animals and the physical environment, then, and I'm sorry, I misspoke there. Um, but when we look at two as opposed to three, it's leaving out the plants. And since those are living as well, they, needs to, they need to be a part of the community. So the population perspective, you can't look at just an organism to 
successfully look at most concepts within ecology because you're not looking at just one individual. You're looking at the very least at how those individuals interact with all of the other members of their species and generally beyond the population to the community level with the interactions as well. As well. But if you took Bio 101 last semester, pretty much everything there was at the individual level. We were looking at cells and macromolecules and in the individual genome. And so to start this semester with ecology, we're really looking at the population and community levels and beyond. So when we look at population ecology, we have to consider everything that can happen within that population. So we're going to have births take place. We're going to have deaths occur. We're going to have immigration, in other words, other individuals of the same species moving into the area, and emigration, where individuals of that species leave the area. And the balancing act between all of these things, the things that will lead the population to grow, the births and the immigration, and all of those things that will lead the population to dwindle, the deaths and the emigration, all have to be considered when you look at population ecology as a whole. So populations can grow, but they can't grow forever. In a stable population, think about these two questions. So how many of five million eggs that a female fish might lay over the course of her life will tend to survive and grow to adulthood? And who would leave more surviving individual offspring, a pair of elephants or a pair of rabbits, if we're going to look at a stable population? And so it's kind of a trick question because if we look at a stable population, what that means is one that is not growing. So if a female fish has five million eggs, obviously she had one mate. So two fish gave rise to these five million eggs. That would mean that in a stable population, two of them should survive and grow to adulthood. Two offspring to replace the two parents. And similarly, for the elephants and the rabbits, certainly we know that rabbits breed like, well, you know, rabbits, and elephants breed very slowly. In a stable population, one in which it did not grow, the two parents should have leave two offspring that survive until adulthood. And if that is the case, the population will remain stable. Now, when a population does not remain stable, we can have what's called exponential growth, when they reproduce more offspring than simply replacing the number. And exponential growth will be uncontrollable, and it is never sustainable over a long period of time. So if we look over the span of these seven years, we look at an initial population of 50 rabbits that grows very rapidly into over 1,000. That is typical of exponential growth where you to connect those dots into a curved line trending upwards. That is the mathematical graph for exponential growth. But quite clearly, that will never be able to be sustained because the resources that were able to feed and house and shelter Five, uh, sorry, 50 rabbits would not likely be suitable to sustain 1,342 rabbits. And so whether it is through lack of food, lack of water, increased predation, whatever, that population would not be stable and we would have an increased mortality rate that would bring that population back to something more sustainable. So if we want to look at how quickly a population grows, then we're looking at growth rate, which mathematically is shown as R. And the number of individuals in the population is shown as the capital letter N. And so if we multiply R times N, we will get the population, the new population after time, knowing the growth rate and knowing the number of individuals that we're starting with. Um, and actually, we'd have to add to that the um, amount of time over which it is growing. So if we start with 500 individuals in a population, and over the course of a year, 125 offspring are born, then we would take the new offspring or the increase in population and divide that by the total population, which was 500. And when we do 125 divided by 500, we get 0.25 births. 
so that is the growth rate. And if we look at 25 of those 50, 500 individuals die during the year, we could find out the rate of deaths, and so that would be 25 divided by 500 or 0.05 deaths. And so if we look at the positive growth of the births and the negative death, the, sorry, the negative growth of the deaths, and either add the negative or subtract those two, we get 0 0.20 individuals per person or a growth rate of 2, 0.20 or 20%. And if we look at, again, this is mathematically the exponential growth curve. You can see the graph on the top and the table on the left showing the same information. Exponential growth will happen if there are no factors limiting the growth. But again, it will never be stable. And so this is one for you to try on your own. And when you're ready, advance the slide and I'll go over the answers. So if you had 100 individuals and 20 births and 10 deaths, the growth rate would be 20 divided by 100, which would be 0.2. And the negative rate would be 100 divided by 10, which is 0.1. And if we subtract those two, we get 0.2 minus 0.1, which is a positive 0.1. So we would have 0.1 individuals per person growth, so a 10% positive growth rate. Okay, and now how many people would be in that population at the end of the year? So again, think about it, pause the video, and when you're ready, start the video again. And so we see 110. We had the initial 100, plus we, plus we had a growth rate of 10 people per year, so 100 plus 10 is 110. And if you follow the link, that will take you to uh, the website that I created, and there are additional practice problems if you need uh, more work on these uh, population formula. So a population's growth is limited by its environment. Again, any living organism is going to need food, shelter, water. It's going to need protection from predators, um, and so the environment is going to dictate how large or how small this population is. So density dependent factors are factors that are going to affect the population, but they will have a greater effect as the population is larger and a lesser effect with a smaller population. So with a larger number of gazelle, there is a greater risk of predation by lions. Food supply is another density dependent factor. The more organisms there are, the more likely they are to overgraze. So food supply is a greater concern to a large population than a small one. Same thing with parasites and disease risk. With a large population living in close proximity, whether it's humans or any other animal, you are more susceptible to predation, uh, sorry, to parasites and disease than you are in a small population. And Habitat for living and breeding. The more individuals or the smaller the habitat, as is often the case after humans come to an area, the more difficult it is for organisms to survive. And so we get things like cougars or mountain lions coming down into human populated areas because with too large of a number of organisms or too small of a habitat, we have problems. And these are, again, all density dependent. The larger the population, the more of a problem these are. So as we look at population density and these density dependent factors, we have to consider the carrying capacity, which is mathematically represented by the letter K. As we look at the red line and the blue idealized line, we see the blue line is what would generally happen. So we see an increasing population until it reaches its carrying capacity, which is the maximum capacity that the environment can hold. And we see that what will tend to happen is rather, uh, when we look at the red line, which is an actual population, we see that it very rarely follows precisely the mathematical model, but it will overshoot for a little bit. We'll get too many individuals that are exceeding the carrying capacity and then they die off. Those density dependent factors 
will cause an increase in the death rate, bringing the population below that maximum sustainable number or the carrying capacity. Then we'll slowly rise again, but it'll always oscillate going slightly above and slightly below the carrying capacity as those density dependent factors help to keep the population fairly stable. And again, we can calculate carrying capacity somewhat by using that R times N again. And when we multiply K, which is the carrying capacity, uh, subtract by the number in the population, and then divide it by the carrying capacity again, we'll have what the population's growth estimate is. And it should be a number between 0 and 1. The closer to 1 it is, the more stable a population is. So again, we're looking at another mathematical model showing the exponential growth going skyrocketing upwards. Again, this is mathematically possible, but not sustainable in a real population. We see the red line of carrying capacity, the maximum number of individuals that a population can sustain. And we see logistic growth, which is sort of that S-shaped curve where the population slowly increases and then plateaus out and stays level at its or just below its carrying capacity. Again, this is not generally the case. It will look more like the graph a couple of slides ago that oscillates around the carrying capacity. But logistic growth is a mathematical model for what a population should look like if it stays in a sustainable uh, number. And so if we look here, again, answer the question, uh, pause the video until you answer the question, and then continue it. So if we follow that logistic growth curve back, we'll see it's at around 6, but the population is times 1,000, so approximately 6,000 individuals. Same thing, pause the video until you answer, and then go on. So if we wanted to decrease the number of deer in the area, we would need to increase the number of natural predators. While we have density dependent factors that do increase with a higher population, there are also density independent factors which will keep a population in check. But these do not have any regard for the size of the population. And often these are weather based or natural disaster based. They happen when they happen. They don't happen because the population is large. And these are things like volcanic eruptions, heat or cold, storms, floods, droughts, Hurricane Katrina, and the flooding that resulted after that would be an example of a density independent factor. Um, and what you will tend to get mathematically when you look at a graph of this is on that lower left, you'll see that the population has that standardized logistic growth model, but it doesn't actually follow that if you look at the number of individuals. The number of individuals will slowly rise over time, but then you get a drought, bang, and it decreases the population as individuals die as a result of the drought. And then they'll slowly recover from that, but then bam, it reduces again when they have a really harsh winter. They recover, but then lower again as you have fatalities after a hurricane and more difficulty with agriculture. The same thing, it grows again, but then a fire comes. And so we'll have these mass mortality events or die-offs each time we have one of these density independent factors limiting the population size. And once again, pause the video while you answer and advance when you're ready to see the answer. And so the density independent factor would be one that has no bearing on the size of the population. And so that would be a dam breaking. The dam doesn't break because you have more people living there. The dam breaks because the dam breaks. And how many people can Earth support? So essentially, what is the human carrying capacity? And this is something we're going to come back and visit again. But one thing that happens is that the carrying capacity for humans keeps rising as we become better at living in new areas. We become better at 
producing more food and we become better at growing at living in new areas so with increased opportunity for food and for housing as we get this vertical agriculture on the right we also get vertical housing so all of a sudden if we can live in skyscrapers and significantly if we can have arboritum or agricultural use of a 57 story uh, massive building we can now all of a sudden have a lot more people living per square mile higher crop yields drought resistant plants pest resistant plants irrigation improvements that we can now grow food in areas where we never could before um, all make it so that more and more people are able to be supported but humans just like any other organism are subject to the problems of density dependent factors and